Thank you very much for inviting me here. I'm sorry I haven't been here for all of the Congress, uh, but it sounds like some fascinating data on this subject has already been presented. Now, I'm not going to talk about diabetes. I'm not going to talk about gut hormones. I'm certainly not going to talk about microbiota, although I'm sure they're very behaviorally interesting as well as biologically interesting. I'm going to talk a little bit about the psychological determinants of consumption of low-calorie sweetened beverages, and I'm going to put some of that evidence in context because the consumer is getting a very mixed message. Science is divided, and that division plays down into consumers' perception of these things and their response to them. So, all of the studies that we see provoke a lot of activity, a lot of press activity. Are sweeteners really bad for you? Artificial sweeteners, powerful link to diabetes. You can see that at the top. You can see the Daily Express, which is a terrible newspaper, but very popular in the UK. Cancer link to sweetener. But we can see cancer research states. Large studies looking at people have now provided strong evidence that artificial sweeteners are safe. Now, if you're a consumer and you are looking for a solution to weight management, and you are looking to, wait to replace sugar, what do you do? Well, you can always take the recommendation of Donald Trump, who is very uh, unequivocal on this matter. I have never seen a thin person drinking Diet Coke. Uh, other beverages, of course, are available. Uh, so... <laughs> So you can see it, it, it's really in the popular culture, and people are discussing this. You look at it all over the internet. Now I'm, uh, you know, I'm like many people struggle with my weight, and I'm in an elderly fat man's boxing group. So we have a little Facebook page where we all support each other, and regularly my friends are posting things about aspartame being the new toxic and this, that, and the other. You know, you see it all over Facebook. I mean, people really do are really are fascinated by this subject. So what relevance does this have? Well, goal conflict theory tells us two things. Chronic dieters are juggling two conflicting goals. The first is the hedonic enjoyment of nice tasting foods and beverages, and the second is diet and weight control. Now, do low calorie sweetened beverages uh, address this? Do they align those conflicting goals and promote successful weight control, or do they not? Now, as part of a larger study, which I'm going to be talking about a little later on, we developed a psychometric tool to look up about beliefs and attitudes around low-calorie sweetened beverages. And what we did is obviously looked at this tool, then went on to look at this tool in terms of how frequent consumers viewed the beverages and how non-consumers viewed these beverages. And not surprisingly, frequent consumers had higher beliefs that low-calorie beverages were palatable and enjoyable, but also effective at controlling their appetite and weight relative to non-frequent consumers. Of course, that would be a truism, but it was nice to see. It was also interesting to note that the frequent consumers had higher BMI, higher dietary restraint, and more body weight concerns. So there was a reason that they were likely to be consuming these things. Uh, non obviously, non-frequent consumers did not share these beliefs. There we go. So, in this context, there is a concern, as I've alluded to. There are concerns that low-calorie stim uh, sweetness stimulate appetite, promote preference for sweet-tasting food, lead to overall greater energy intake, and therefore lead to weight gain. Now, you've seen lots of these meta-analysis and systematic reviews presented previously. I'm going to talk a little bit about appetite and energy intake. I'm not going to refer to the weight management data or the risk data here. Here is the experimental studies taken out of the uh, uh, Pete Rogers review, uh, which you saw referenced earlier on. And what we see in experimental studies is there is lower energy intake associated with low-calorie sweeteners compared with sugar. So in experimental pre-low designs, unfortunately often acute designs, we see that actually low-calorie sweetener use is associated with reduced energy, energy intake. Problem is lacking some longer-term studies, but there are ECTs, RCTs. It's also worth pointing out that in these experimental stu studies, energy intake was equivalent between the low-calorie sweetener conditions and the water condition as well. 
If we turn to randomized control trials, and this is a, another systematic review, uh, Miller and Perez, but it, 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 it's the same picture if we look at the uh, uh, Pete Rogers one as well. Uh, they see lower energy intake, body weight, fat mass associated with calorie sweetened consumption, although the effects are relatively modest. But this is what the press... Now, The Guardian is meant to be actually a quite credible newspaper in the UK, but they decided to go with this particular review. Now, this review is not a systematic review or any form of meta-analysis, as far as I'm aware. Uh, people could correct me. And looking at it, it rather lends itself to a, a, a preference for observational studies over randomised control trials. It's very dismissive of the randomised control trials. Now, I'm not going to talk about observational studies. I suspect those will be dealt with in the last presentation, so I'll leave that there. But it's important to think about the impact of this on consumers. So if we... Oops, that's, that's buzzing. I don't know what that means. So if we move back to core questions again, do consumers, do consumers assume that they can eat more food because their drinks are low in sugar? I think that's quite an important question and might speak to some of the observational data. Or are consumers using low calorie sweetened beverages as a strategy to control food, cravings and intake? Well, we decided to test this in a short, a little experimental study. We're very much in the start of the process here. But we took our low-calorie consumers and our non-consumers, and we put them in a food cra craving inducement pa uh, paradigm. So basically, we get them to sniff, look at, uh, be around chocolate, but we don't allow them to eat it. So a terribly, terribly cruel thing to do. Uh, <laughs> Well, we get it through ethics, and it's only a cute study, and they're allowed to eat uh, later on. And as a control condition, they have to do the same for wooden blocks. You always need a control. You always need a comparator. And I'm not aware that anybody craves uh, or is sensorily uh, excited by wooden blocks, but I may be wrong there. <laughs> and then after that, they, we gave them ad libitum, ad libitum access to... Uh, uh, high energy, appealing foods, sweet or savoury, and we also allow them a range of beverages to drink from at the same time. Well, first of all, the craving manipulation worked, and it worked uh, in the control group, uh, and it worked, uh, sorry, it worked in the, in the low calorie uh, consumers, and it worked in the non consumers as well. We induced craving, and funny enough, wooden blocks didn't. What did this mean? Well, actually, in the frequent consumer control group, when they had, in, well, when they were exposed to craving, they actually didn't increase their consumption. But in the group who were not frequent consumers, or weren't consumers of low calorie sweetened beverages, we actually got an increase in energy intake. Okay. So, what is happening? Well, what we see from the beverage intake is that the frequent consumers in control and craving condition consume their favourite low-calorie sweetened beverages. The non-consumers in control and craving conditions consume some sugar-sweetened beverages, consume some water, that's good, again, validation of our, of our categorization of them, but where the increase in energy intake is coming from is actually coming from the foods. So what we can at least infer from this is the frequent consumers having access to low-calorie sweetened beverages allows them to resist craving, although they're not increasing the consumption of low-calorie beverages to actually deal with the cravings in the, in the presence of food, which is tempting. We were quite interested in potential bias. Potential bias is, is, is quite good because it, 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 it's behaviour, or it's a behavioural response not in control of the individual. Food intake is a bit of a tricky one because they're in a laboratory setting and there obviously is the potential to, for response bias. We were interested in low-calorie sweetened beverages and do they promote a preference for sweet-tasting foods in general? Or did they just provoke a specific attention to low-calorie sweetness? And certainly in the frequent consumers, they had a intentional bias towards low-calorie beverages over water. Okay, that's not surprising. The non-consumers didn't. But let's look at their uh, attentional bias for the caloric beverage. Now, if low-calorie sweeteners produced preferences for all sweet things, they should also increase the attentional bias for the caloric beverage. They didn't. 
In low-calorie sweetened beverage consumers, their attentional bias was significantly greater towards the diet drink compared with the sugar drink. So there is no generalizability here, at least on acute studies. But we don't really know much beyond these acute studies, but we can make a few conclusions at this point. Certainly, we know that restrained eating patterns, body weight concerns, and positive beliefs about the palatability and appetite controlling uh, properties of low calorie sweetened beverages are associated with low calorie beverage consumption. And that's not surprising when we talk about this in the context of people trying to control their own appetite and trying to actively uh, engage in weight management. We know that the consumption of low-calorie beverages may help consumers align these conflicting goals. Certainly, the, the, the preliminary evidence suggests that. And frequent consumers of low-calorie sweetened beverages may use it as a successful strategy, certainly in situations where they're experiencing craving. And we know that frequent consumers show an intentional bias towards their favourite low-calorie beverage, which is not generalised to sweet-tasting drinks per se. So consuming a low-calorie beverage, it doesn't cue you up for co uh, consuming or being attending to the caloric equivalent. But these are small-scale experimental studies, and beliefs about low-calorie sweetened beverages are polarised. Now, obviously, fostering positive attitudes is likely to improve the uptake of these things if they're useful. Conversely, data failing to support their role in weight management will be critical to their potential role. We do need more studies, and I think this is one thing you see at the end of every, every review, be it on one side or the other, we need more long-term studies. And of course, that's uh, great for people who want funding to do lots of long-term studies, so that's brilliant. Uh, but we need to understand not only their effects, but the physiological and psychological mechanisms underpinning these effects as well. And that's what we're really not getting from these larger scale, scale studies, is when we see the results, we don't understand what we're seeing. Now, I'm going to talk a little bit about one study which hopes to address this. This is the SWITCH study, which is the effect of non-nutritive sweetened beverages on appetite during active weight loss. And for those of you who are familiar with the PETA studies, uh, and you'll see the 12-week and the year-long data, this is an expansion on that study, both in the number of participants, but it also addresses an important question. In the PETA study, non nutritive sweetened beverage consumers were randomised to non nutritive sweeteners or water. We actually do the randomization both ways around. So we're actually having water consumers randomised to NSS beverages as well. So we want to determine if weight loss, the experience of a weight loss program, and ease of weight loss remains the same for non nutritive sweetened beverage consumers who are explicitly provided these beverages compared with consumers who are provided water. And we want to directly compare the effects of these beverages on appetite expression, energy intake, food choice in a subset of non nutritive sweetened beverage consumers compared to those consuming water. So we're keying into uh, biological mechanisms. How much time do I have? Sorry. About four minutes, right, okay. Well, I'll, I'll try and get us, catch us up a bit of time so we can have some talk at the end. This is actually the protocol. The protocol is already published, so I'd, I'd guide you to the publication. But some key points is, is we provide weekly weight loss sessions for 12 weeks, and then for the rest of the 52 weeks, we provide monthly weight loss sessions. This is based on Colorado Way. It's a Liverpool version of Colorado Way, because there's lots of things that we do in Liverpool that people don't do in Colorado. Uh, for a start, we have terrible weather in Liverpool, so telling people to walk for an hour a day is just not going to happen in January. Uh, also, UK alcohol consumption is phenomenal compared with Denver, so... Uh, we really did have to uh, change uh, the way we approach a couple of sessions around that. In a subset, we're going to look at uh, appetite. So we've got 116 from the uh, half and half from the two things. We're going to look at appetite expression, energy intake and food choice. And we're also going to look at body composition as well. 
This is the bit we're particularly proud of, the Switch Weight Management Programme. And, and as I say, it is a comprehensive programme. We have 12 sessions for the 12 weeks, and we also have monthly sessions thereafter, which do address uh, 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 lots of different issues. It's based on, as I say, a validated programme, a validated approach. And the fact that we're able to offer it to 400 people, over 400 people in Liverpool, where there is very little uh, provision for weight management, I think is a brilliant thing. And that I'm incredibly proud of. So irrespective of the condition people are in, they're going to access to quality weight management. And just to highlight the outcome measures, the primary outcome measure is weight change. That's not surprising. But we're going to have physiological measures. We're going to look at glycemic control, fasted lipids, triglycerides, lipoproteins, uh, liver function check, chest, and we're also going to look at uh, changes in body composition. We also have psychological measures, a lot of those on pro days, changing in food preferences, cravings, eating behaviors. And we're also going to look at the experience and ease of weight loss. Uh, in terms of the weight loss phase and also the weight maintenance phase. But what's important to measure, we've also got a lot of questionnaires and self-report tools across the entire study population collected at three key time points. Now, I'm not going to break this down for reasons of time, but we do have, and we can argue about the value of uh, diaries and food frequency questionnaires, but we will be collecting that data across the entire cohort. So at least we will have some self-reported data at all times time points by which we can triangulate what we see in terms of weight management uh, uh, with what we're observing in the laboratory in terms of direct measures of, of behavioural correlates. Now, I'm not going to talk about the EU Horizon Suite project because my good colleague Anna is going to address this, but we have just been jointly leading with Copenhagen, awarded a Horizon 2020 €9 million Euro 27 partner project to look at some of the more mechanistic aspects of this and at that point I'll stop because I don't really want to steal Anna's thunder here. I need to acknowledge my colleagues particularly on switch and it is very important to make sure of this slide around conflicts of interest. We are supported uh, by lots of different companies and in the switch study is funded by the American Beverage Association. I am a speaker and advisory board member and a task force member for ILSI. And of course, one of the big criticisms is ILSI and industry funding here. We might as well get that out in the air. But I take no personal payment for any of this. All the money goes back to the university. That's not me, just me being whiter than white. UK tax returns are hellish. And by and large, it's not worth the grief. Thank you very much. Uh, and enjoy the rest of the conference.